Hello again and Merry Christmas from Fox News in Washington. Well, with terror attacks across Europe, Donald Trump was talking this week about how he intends to keep our country safe, including plans to limit who is allowed into the U.S. Joining me now to discuss what the president-elect will do is former House Speaker Newt Gingrich. Mr. Speaker, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Before we get to the war on terror, uh, President-elect Trump seems to have, in some sense, reset our nuclear policy this week. After Vladimir Putin talked about building up Russia's nuclear arsenal, Mr. Trump tweeted this, the United States must greatly strengthen and expand its nuclear capability until such time as the world comes to its senses regarding nukes. And when asked to clarify, Mr. Trump told a reporter, let it be an arms race. We will outmatch them at every pass and outlast them all. Question, are we back in an arms race with Russia? Well, let me point out, this is the same Donald Trump the liberals were terrified was going to sell out to Putin, who's now pivoted and said, look, as, as to quote General Mattis, we can be your best friend or we can be your worst enemy. You want to make threatening speeches? Let me show you what a threatening speech looks like. And he does it in 140 characters. Uh, the truth is the Russians have been rebuilding their nuclear capability. We have allowed ours to wait to weaken. The Chinese have been rebuilding their nuclear capability. The North Koreans are trying to build missiles to reach the continental United States. The Iranians are trying to build a nuclear weapon. I think for the, president, the next president to say, you know, we're going to have to systematically rebuild our nuclear capability is exactly right. And if that means, and he's also said, serving notice. If, if he succeeds economically in making America great again, and we get back to 5 or 6% real growth, we can outproduce everybody. And I think what he's t t telling both the Chinese and the Russians is, you really want to be in this competition? Because if it's going to be a competition, we have the potential to win it. But, but a, a, a couple of questions there. First of all, the manner in which he did it. I mean, you say in 140 characters, is, is this really any way to conduct foreign policy? And second, it's one thing to talk about modernizing our nuclear arsenal. Uh, he had said that during the campaign. But expanding the arsenal that flies in the face of a half century of arms control, limiting, reducing our number of weapons. Right, which has failed. We've had arms control. The Chinese have had an arms buildup. We've had arms control. The North Koreans have developed nuclear weapons. But the Russians have... The Russians, the Russians in the last few years have increased the, capacity, the capability of their systems dramatically. They've introduced new missiles. They've introduced new kinds of missiles that are designed to avoid our anti-ballistic missile systems. Uh, there are a number of steps they're taking to be a war-fighting capability. And we have, to, we have to candidly overmatch that. It's not something we want to do. But if you're going to be in the real world. And, and on the tweeting thing, let me just suggest, if I might, um, we might as well get used to it. This is who he is. It's how he's going to operate, uh, whether it's brilliant or stupid. Um, he beat 16 uh, rivals, and then he beat Hillary Clinton, and he beat the elite media. He ain't giving it up. Do you think it's brilliant or stupid? I think it's brilliant. Because, because first of all, he's able very quickly, over and over again, to set the agenda and at almost no cost. During the campaign, Mr. Trump talked about working with Putin in the war on terror. Here's a clip. We could find common ground with Russia in the fight against ISIS. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Wouldn't that be a good thing? So after you heard things like that and what he said during the campaign, does Mr. Trump view Putin as an ally? or an adversary, and what happens when he sees that Russia's core strategic objectives, whether it's in the Middle East or on nuclear arms or on a whole host of subjects like Ukraine, are very different than our own? Well, I think right now he sees Putin as potentially either or both. There are places you compete, there are places you cooperate. This has been true, by the way, all through the tension with Putin, we've been using Russian rockets to put Americans up to the space station because NASA was so screwed up and so mismanaged, we don't have an American rocket right now. So the Russians have allowed us to use their rockets to get into space at the same time we're yelling at each other. So you can have a lot of different things going on simultaneously. I think he also recognizes the total failure of the obama Kerry, clinton foreign strategy in this region. You now have had a meeting in Moscow of Turkey, our NATO ally for over a half century, Iran and Russia, to decide to talk about Syria with zero American input. 
That should really trouble us, that we've, we've reached a dead end of weakness, and we have got to rethink what we're doing. We began this program talking about the wave of terror attacks this week in Europe, uh, Switzerland, Turkey, obviously in Berlin. Do you have any idea what President Trump's strategy is to fight ISIS both overseas and on the homeland? He has been very vague about his plans. I, I don't think they have a strategy yet. I think what they know, which is important, is that they're going to need a strategy. Uh, they have in General Flynn and General Mattis and Gen General Kelly three remarkably experienced war fighters. I think they're going to be able to produce a very aggressive strategy. Uh, they have a much better grip on reality than the Obama administration did. Uh, but this, this is going to be a very hard problem. And my suggestion is people should go back and look at how Lincoln dealt with uh, Southern sympathizers during the Civil War. We passed the Sedition Act, for example, uh, which changed our ability to control people who were advocating uh, treason. So I, I think we're going to have to really think about what are the rules of the game and how do we succeed. You know, we found out again apparently in the last few days that the Europeans were actually looking at this Tunisian uh, before he attacked the Christmas market in Berlin. I mean, uh, we, again and again we find people that we were sort of looking at, and then they go kill a bunch of folks. Let's turn to the domestic side. What do you think of the president-elect intervening with individual companies that are talking about moving, and this week intervening with federal contractors on planes, that uh, budget overruns and things like that? I, I, I want to ask you about this. Here's what I, the exchange I had with Mr. Trump recently. What about the free market, sir? That, that is, it's not free market when they go out and they move and they sell back into our country. But that's the free market. They made a decision. It makes... No, that's the, that's the dumb market, okay? That's the dumb market. Should the President of the United States be telling private businesses what to do? The President of the United States should, should do everything he can to keep companies in the U.S. And the President of the United States should be very tough on large companies who have been rigging the entire process of, of acquisition to their advantage and to the disadvantage of the American people. The, Trump is going to be more like a governor than like our traditional sense of a president. Governors intervene. They're aggressive. They're in your face. I think the F-35 program has been a disgrace. I think the acquisition process of the Pentagon has to be totally redone. Uh, and I think that uh, serving notice that we are not trapped by large contractors with big armies of lobbyists is, is going to shake up Washington about as much as any single thing you could do. Let's talk about the current president, President Obama. This week he banned oil exploration on millions of acres, both in the Arctic and the Atlantic. There's a lot of talk that he's about to transfer as many as 18 detainees uh, from Guantanamo to other countries. But this, pre this president, who has made heavy use of executive action, had this advice for Donald Trump. Listen. My suggestion to the uh, to the president-elect is, you know, going through the uh, legislative process is always better, in part because it's harder to undo. What's going on here with President Obama? I think President Obama is beginning to figure out that his legacy is like one of those dolls that, as the air comes out of it, shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. And that 60 or 70 percent of his legacy is executive orders, almost all of which will be repudiated by, by Trump. The things he's done this week I, can be turned around. It takes a little bit of legalized the smart lawyers, but they'll turn it around. And he's in this desperate frenzy. What he's actually doing is he's setting up a whole series of things to distract Trump, which will make his liberal allies feel good about Democrats and hate Republicans when Trump rolls them all back. Uh, but I think, you know, he's right. Uh, the movie Lincoln has this extraordinary moment where Lincoln says, look, we have to have a constitutional amendment ending slavery because we have to lock it into the Constitution or it could be repealed. And, and I think had uh, Obama understood the centrality of that to the American system, he would have passed a very different Obamacare on a bipartisan basis. He would have done many other things. He would have been a more limited president, but his uh, legacy would have lasted far longer. Speaking of presidents and legacies, how transformative a president do you think Donald Trump will be, and how quickly will we see whether that's the case or not? He has recruited a cabinet of winners. I mean, their number one characteristic of that entire cabinet, these are very successful, powerful people who like winning and are prepared to work very hard to win. They will face a crisis probably around March 
when they realize how big the swamp is and how many alligators there are. And they, have, they will then reach a crisis. Now, I have to ask, because you were the one who said, well, I'm not sure. He I really was wrong. I was totally wrong. I blew it. He, he, I talked to him the other day, and he said, no, come on. So I had to go and do a Facebook Live and say I made a boo-boo, uh, which I then got attacked by people for saying I made a boo-boo. But I did. Uh, he clearly he said flatly, and he tweeted again. He likes the term. He's, ha he's happy to use the term. But my point is this. Everybody who comes into the city underestimates how really hard to change the city is. I say this as a former Speaker of the House who did a fair amount of change. Right. But boy, I mean, it was all uphill. It was all hard, and in the end, it wore us out. They'll reach a crisis point where they've got to look in a room at each other. They're all winners. And they're going to say either we've got to be more reasonable and get along with the city, or we have to become even more unreasonable and break the power structure that's opposing us. My hunch is they'll pick the latter, but that will be the decisive moment of his domestic presidency. Which way do they go? If they decide collectively that they want to break the existing power structure, they have the resources to do it, uh, and it will be then the kind of presidency you'll love covering. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, say, I have to say I feel like a cub reporter already. I've never seen any of this before. Finally, we've got about a minute left. I want to talk about you. You say you will be the, the senior strategic planner for this administration, but when reporters have followed up and asked transition officials, say, they say there's no such formal or informal role. So what will you be doing? I'll be planning and trying to focus on the things I think are strategically the most important for the administration. And, and has President Trump, President-elect Trump, given you that we, we've charter? We've talked about it several times. I suspect I'll get a letter from him that when, once he's president. But, it, but I think my, my, my access is fairly overwhelming, and my ability to reach across to the House and the Senate and to the governors and state legislators. I mean, we have a whole system here. Uh, that's the nature of the American system. And uh, you know, my first big step towards this will be a, a series of speeches at Heritage on Trumpism and, and what is Trumpism, and then probably a book in the late spring. But that's because we're going to get 4,000 federal employees who are brand new, eager people. They need to understand how different Trump is, and that it's not just a personality quirk. It is a way of thinking and a way of doing business, uh, and it's learnable, uh, but it is very different from what we've seen in the past. Speaker Gingrich, thank you. Thank you for your time, and thank you for joining us on Christmas Day. And have a happy new year. And a happy new year to you as well. Real growth. We can outproduce everybody. And I think what he's t t telling both the Chinese and the Russians is, you really want to be in this competition? Because if it's going to be a competition, we have the potential to win it. But, but a, a, a couple of questions there. First of all, the manner in which he did it. I mean, you say in 140 characters, is, is this really any way to conduct foreign policy? And second, it's one thing to talk about modernizing our nuclear arsenal. Uh, he had said that during the campaign. But expanding the arsenal that flies in the face of a half century of arms control, limiting, reducing our number of weapons. Right, which has failed. We've had arms control. The Chinese have had an arms buildup. We've had arms control. The North Koreans have developed nuclear weapons. But the Russians have. The Russians, the Russians in the last few years have increased the capacity, the capability of their systems dramatically. They've introduced new missiles. They've introduced new kinds of missiles that are designed to avoid our anti-ballistic missile systems. And outlast them all. Question: Are we back in an arms race with Russia? Well, let me point out: This is the same Donald Trump. The liberals were terrified was going to sell out to Putin, who's now pivoted and said, look, as, as to quote General Mattis, we can be your best friend or we can be your worst enemy. You want to make threatening speeches? Let me show you what a threatening speech looks like. And he does it in 140 characters. Uh, the truth is the Russians have been rebuilding their nuclear capability. We have allowed ours to, wait, to weaken. The Chinese have been rebuilding their nuclear capability. The North Koreans are trying to build missiles to reach the continental United States. The Iranians are trying to build a nuclear weapon. I think for the, president, the next president to say, you know, we're going to have to systematically rebuild our nuclear capability is exactly right. And if that means, and he's also said, serving notice. If, if he succeeds economically in making America great again, and we get back to 5 or 6 percent. Hello again, and Merry Christmas from Fox News in Washington. Well, with terror attacks across Europe, Donald Trump was talking this week about how he intends to keep our country safe including plans to limit who is allowed into the U.S. Joining me now to discuss what the president-elect will do is former House Speaker Newt Gingrich. Mr. Speaker, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Before we get to the war on terror, uh, President-elect Trump seems to have, in some sense, reset 
our nuclear policy this week. After Vladimir Putin talked about building up Russia's nuclear arsenal, Mr. Trump tweeted this, the United States must greatly strengthen and expand its nuclear capability until such time as the world comes to its senses regarding nukes. And when asked to clarify, Mr. Trump told a reporter, let it be an arms race. We will outmatch them at every pass. Uh, there are a number of steps they're taking to be a war fighting capability. And we have, to, we have to candidly overmatch that. It's not something we want to do, but if you're going to be in the real world. And, and on the tweeting thing, let me just suggest, if I might, um, we might as well get used to it. This is who he is. It's how he's going to operate, uh, whether it's brilliant or stupid. Um, he beat 16 uh, rivals, then he beat Hillary Clinton, and he beat the elite media. He ain't giving it up. Do you think it's brilliant or stupid? I think it's brilliant. Because, because, first of all, he's able very quickly, over and over again, to set the agenda. And at almost no cost. During the campaign, Mr. Trump talked about working with Putin in the war on terror. Here's a clip. We could find common ground with Russia in the fight against ISIS. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Wouldn't that be a good thing? So... After you heard things like that and what he said during the campaign, does Mr. Trump view Putin as an ally or an adversary? And what happens when he sees that Russia's core strategic objectives, whether it's in the Middle East or on nuclear arms or on a whole host of subjects like Ukraine, are very different than our own? Well, I think right now he sees Putin as potentially either or both. There are places you compete. There are places you cooperate. This has been true, by the way, all through the tension with Putin. We've been using Russian rockets to put Americans up to the space station because NASA was so screwed up and so mismanaged, we don't have an American rocket right now. So the Russians have allowed us to use their rockets to get into space at the same time we're yelling at each other. So you can have a lot of different things going on simultaneously. 